been here recently, that's an invitation to speak. <laughs> um, Lord, I praise you that I can find rest in you because you are what? My Father in heaven. My Father in heaven. The Almighty. The Almighty. Always faithful. Always faithful. Most holy God. Most holy God. Comforter. Comforter. Merciful. Merciful. The Good Shepherd. Good shepherd. Lord, I praise you because I can find rest in you because you are. Thank you. One of the other phrases in there where sin runs deep, your grace is more. We talked about that in class this morning. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Lord, I praise you that your grace abounds even when. Blank, fill in the blank. Lord, I praise you that your grace abounds even when. Even when I don't deserve it. That's what grace means, I guess. Lord, I praise you. Your grace abounds even when. Lord, I fail. When I sin. That's a harder question, I know. I'll give you a few seconds. I praise you. Your grace abounds even when. When I forget. When I forget. I'm distracted by things in the world. Oh, I distract it. you even when even when I play when I don't feel it when I don't feel it the events of the flesh the events of the flesh even when I get into the flesh when I'm out of control when I'm out of control when I'm yeah when I'm out of control not in control taking this, this time this morning for us to focus like that because it helps us to turn our minds on him, right? It helps us to realize our position before him. It helps us to realize our greatness, uh, his greatness, um, and, and our need for him. Let's go to God in prayer and then we'll, we'll continue singing. Lord God, Holy is your name. Holy is your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we praise you. You heard our voices for all the reasons that we praise you. And you heard our voices for the reasons that we don't deserve your grace. But you pour it out on us anyway. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that grace and for that mercy. Help us to praise you today. Help, help our praise come from our overflowing of our love for you this morning. It's through your son we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Light of the world. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that makes this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am.
more powerful than any problem that we face. Pray that you help us to be able to give our problems and our concerns to you and let you take care of them. There's some here that have family that are ill, that are sick, gravely so. Father, we would pray for healing. Yes. We pray that you comfort the families. We pray that you heal those who are sick and need your healing touch. Father, we thank you for the way that you shower your love on us. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, for the peace that we can have in being your children. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. How are you? How beautiful the hands that serve, the wine and the bread, and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walk, the long dusty road, and the hill to the cross. Jesus have to die. I believe that everyone in this room knows why Jesus had to die. And I believe that everyone throughout the world that meets this morning in the name of Christ knows why Jesus had to die. But why did he have to die such a horrible and terrible death? Everybody dies. We're all going to grow old and die if we don't die before we grow old. Why did he have to die? And why did he have to die that horrible death? There was a lot of anger and bitterness and hatefulness that was involved in his death. He was betrayed, as we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, about his death. 
if we start in the garden where he was betrayed by Jesus, where the officials came with weapons to arrest him, he wasn't a violent man. He could have been arrested in the temple as he was preaching at any time, but they did it in the darkness. And then the mock trial that they gave. It's an interesting study to see how many of the laws, the laws of Moses, that they violated in his trial. But they accused him, convicted him of blasphemy, saying that he claimed to be deity. He was deity. He is deity. He's always been deity, even before the foundation of the world. They crucified him, and yet he laid down his life. He gave his life, the ultimate gift of love. They could not have killed him had he resisted. He could have called thousands of angels, but he laid down his life because he loved us, because we needed we needed our sins forgiven because our sins separate us from God. And it was through his death that he paid the price for our sins. For which we should be very thankful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents the body of Christ. We thank you, Father, for Christ dying on the cross and giving his life for our sins. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this, that we will remember him, remember how he died, the horrible death that he died, and not only the death that he died, the pain that he suffered physically, the fact that he took on the sins of the world. He became sin for us. We thank you, Father. We pray that you'll help us to partake of this in a manner pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The fact that he died on the cross is not the end of the story. Jesus said that as often as we do this, we do it in remembrance of him. Paul indicated that we show forth his death until he comes again. He's not dead. He died, but he's not dead because he rose from the grave, victorious over death. He died. He arose ascended into heaven. He's there now. He's our king. He's on the throne. But he's coming again. And so we remember him until he comes again. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine that represents your son's blood. We thank you for the blood that he shed on the cross forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for his resurrection, victorious over death. We thank you, Father, for him reigning in heaven. And we pray, Father, that we will always remember that he is our king and he is our savior and he deserves our love, our worship. And we pray, Father,
Lord, listen to the children pray. The Lord, send your spirit in his place. The Lord, listen to your children pray. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Okay, let's pray. We'll go to class. Father God, we love you. We want to learn more and more about you. We want to thank you for Jesus, and we want to learn more about him and all that he does for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good class. It is well with my soul. <clears throat> when peace like a Uh, but I think the ones that we have looked at are, are very 
representative of his prayers and give us a pretty good indication of the kinds of things that Paul typically prayed about. Last week, we looked at his prayer in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And uh, there's one more thing about that prayer that I want to point out this morning in just a moment. And then I, we're not going to spend long in Ephesians 3, uh, but I want to kind of use that as a launch pad to talk about a connection that Paul makes there that I think is extremely significant and that will help us to uh, kind of put a bow on this whole series because I think it really uh, drives the point home. And then I want to give you a, a picture from the Old Testament that I hope will, will give us a way to, to kind of keep this in our minds so that we don't forget it. Ephesians 3, uh, I'm not going to go through this whole prayer again, we covered that last week, but just notice again that there are two purpose statements that Paul gives in this prayer. Uh, the first one is in verse 17, the other in verse 19. He, he prays that God would strengthen these believers through his spirit in the inner man, and that God would help them to, to have the strength to grasp the limitless dimensions of Jesus' magnificent love for them. And the two things that he's aiming for are, number one, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And number two, verse 19, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Without going into all of our discussion from last week, those are basically two ways of saying the same thing. Paul's aim in this prayer, the reason that he is making these particular requests, is that he wants these believers to grow into a place of spiritual maturity. Why does he pray that? Well, the one thing that we didn't talk about last week that I want to get to today is how he starts this prayer in verse 14. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. For this reason. That ties this prayer into what Paul has written earlier. Now, Paul was a preacher, and like most of us preachers, Paul could go off on a tangent. He does that sometimes in his letters. He distracts himself, and uh, he does that in this very chapter. It's interesting that if you trace the thought, the line of his reasoning, and go back to verse 1 of chapter 3, that's where he actually starts this prayer. He, starts, he says in verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father. But he started the prayer back in verse 1, where he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. But then... That thought trails off, and he, he goes off and talks more about something else for a while before he finally comes back around to finishing the prayer that he, that he had started. And that's what he does in verse 14. So the reason that Paul had for praying this prayer actually has its basis in chapters 1 and 2. For this reason, in chapter 3, verse 1, points to chapters 1 and 2. Uh, maybe he had in mind everything that he had written up to that point, but at least what comes immediately before chapter 3, verse 1, and that is Paul's discussion of bringing the Jews and the Gentiles together into one new humanity, one new community in Christ. And notice the last paragraph in chapter 2 that he, uh, he writes right before saying, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father. Consequently, this is verse 19 of chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. <coughs> Paul, what Paul is getting at in this imagery of a building that's being constructed, 
built up into a holy temple in which God will dwell through his spirit. It's the idea of the church coming to maturity. If you want to look at chapter 4, uh, verses 11 through 13, he uses very similar language, and there it's obvious because he actually uses the word maturity. And that's, that's the same thought that you have here at the end of chapter 2. So, if I lost you in all of that detail, here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm trying to, to help you to see about the prayer at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. Paul's thought process goes something like this. Here is God's purpose for the church. God's purpose is to bring his people to spiritual maturity. Now, in light of that, what does Paul do? Paul prays into God's purpose. Paul says, here's what God wants. So I'm going to pray for what God wants. And that's what he does. God wants to bring his church to a place of spiritual maturity. So Paul offers this prayer at the end of chapter 3, stating specific requests that he says the goal of it is to bring the church to spiritual maturity. In other words, Paul was praying according to the will of God. He thought about God's will and then prayed that God's will would be accomplished. Remember 1 John 5, uh, verses 14 and 15? And we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that if he hears us in whatever we ask, we have the requests that, that we have asked from him. That's what Paul is doing. He is praying the will of God. And that's what, that's what he does in all of his prayers. And the ones we looked at in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, he takes God's purposes, what he knows God's will is, and then he prays about those things. And this is necessary because, as we've been talking about in our Sunday morning class, God's will does not automatically get done in the world. God has bound himself to the prayers of his people, and that's why he needs us to cooperate with him in prayer so that his will can get done. And so he tells us to pray and to pray according to his will. Now, I want to give you a picture from a story in the Old Testament that I hope will help to drive this home and, and help us to kind of really fix it in our minds. And if it's not obvious where I'm going at the beginning, just bear with me and I think it will become clear. 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you want to turn there, this is the very familiar story of David and Goliath. Um, remember that the Israelites were at war with the Philistines at this time. And uh, each morning when the two armies would come and face off with one another, the Philistines would send out their, their champion, this enormous giant by the name of Goliath and he would come out and would just taunt the armies of Israel and, and defy them ridicule them and he would challenge them every day send out your best man and I'll take him on and if he wins, if he kills me then the Philistines will be your servants if I win on the other hand then the Israelites will be the Philistines servants we don't have to do this army to army. We can, we can just do this with two men. Just let two of us fight, and we'll, we'll settle this matter. And Israel could not produce a single soldier that was willing to take him on. They were all terrified. Saul, King Saul, was terrified of Goliath. And so this goes on day after day and week after week. And one day, a young shepherd named David 
is given some provisions by his father to take to three of his brothers who are in the Israelite army. So he hasn't been in the army. He hasn't been around the battle. And uh, uh, so he shows up to give his three brothers these provisions that his father has sent. While he's there, he notices what's going on. He sees Goliath come out and, and give his speech and ridicule the armies of, of Israel and make this challenge that, as he's done day after day. And uh, David is incredulous. What in the world is going on here? Why are you letting this man defy the armies of the living God? Who, do you, who does he think he is? And why is he getting away with this? Why is nobody taking him on? Well, word gets back to King Saul that David is talking like this, and King Saul sends for him, and uh, he comes, and David, who has no military experience, who's just a shepherd, says to King Saul, don't lose heart over this uncircumcised Philistine. I will go take care of him for you. And of all things, Saul actually lets him do it. He allows him to go and fight this Philistine giant. He gives him some armor, but David sets that aside. He hasn't tested that armor. And, and so he just goes and finds his sling and five stones. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. What I want you to notice here is David's perception of what he's doing. David is not fighting Goliath because of a personal offense. He's not fighting Goliath because primarily Goliath has insulted the armies of Israel. David is going to war with Goliath because Goliath has defied Almighty God. Uh, earlier in the chapter, he, he says uh, back in verse, uh, what is it, 20, uh, 26, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? God is the one who is being insulted here. God is the one whose honor is at stake. And David says, when God gives me the victory, then all the world will know that there is a God in Israel. And so as he says in verse 47, this battle is the Lord's battle. This is not my fight. This is God's battle. And that's why David fought. God was, uh, David was not asking God to come and help him fight his battle, David's battle. Instead, David was saying, God is being attacked here. I'm going to fight God's battle with him. Now, I think that's an important distinction for us to think about when it comes to our prayers. It's just a different way of saying the same thing that we've been talking about for 
weeks and weeks now in looking at the prayers of Paul. We've been talking about how uh, Paul prayed the will of God. He prayed the purposes of God. Paul thought about what God wanted, and then he prayed that God would get what he wanted. Another way to look at that is in terms of this battle. In your prayers, are you primarily focused on fighting God's battles, or are you primarily focused on asking God to help you fight yours? Now think about that. And throughout this whole series, I've, I've been trying to simply help us to, to think through the way that we typically pray. What are your priorities in prayer? Are your priorities fighting God's battles or your own battles? Well, what's the difference? How can you tell the difference? Well, God's battles would be those things that, that he is specifically trying to accomplish in the world. For example, uh, the prayer that we looked at last week in Ephesians 3. Paul is praying that the church will be brought to a place of spiritual maturity. That is one thing that God is uh, prioritizing as his purpose in this world. He is trying to bring believers to spiritual maturity. That is God's battle. And so Paul says, I'm going to help God fight that battle. I'm going to pray that God's will for his people will be accomplished. Uh, God's will is for the lost to be saved. Jesus said, I, I came to seek and save that which, was, that which is lost. And so when we pray that sinners come to know Jesus, we are fighting God's battle. That is in line with his purpose, right? Uh, and in line with that, one of the specific things that Jesus told us to pray for in Matthew chapter 9 is that the Lord of the harvest will send forth more workers into the harvest. And so that, that's important because that facilitates more people being saved, more people coming into the kingdom. That's, that's fighting God's battle. God wants to send out more workers into the harvest. God wants more people to be saved and to come into the kingdom. Those, those are examples of God's battles that we can help him fight in prayer. What would be some examples of our battles? Uh, well, I might pray about a situation I've got at work, for example. Let's say I'm an engineer, some of you are, and uh, I've got uh, an assignment that is giving me all kinds of trouble. I might pray that God will give me wisdom and insight. Help me, Lord, to, to do a good job with this assignment and to, to figure this out. Or I might pray about my kids and their, their schooling. Maybe they're struggling with their grades in school. And so I pray, Lord, help, help my child. Uh, to, to learn what he needs to learn in school and to keep his grades up. Or, or maybe I pray that, uh, that my daughter is able to get into the college that she wants to go to. Maybe I've got a, a financial problem and uh, I'm praying that God will send me some money, help me with this, this financial issue that I've got. Those are examples of personal concerns that I might have that don't necessarily directly impact the kingdom of God but they impact me, and I'm concerned about them, and there is certainly nothing wrong with praying about those things. The Lord wants us to bring our concerns to God, and He is a loving Father, and He wants us to lay our cares at His feet. The issue is, which is our priority? Is it our priority? What do we spend most of our time praying about in, in, in your private prayers? Do you spend most of your time praying that God, asking God to come help you fight your battles and deal with your concerns, your personal uh, issues and problems and, and things that are, uh, that are troubling you? Or do you pray primarily for God's will to be done? Is it about God's battles or your battles? You know, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 6, after talking about the, uh, uh, the sin of worry and, and, and 
not having trust in God for him to take care of our needs, our food and our clothing and the things that we need to live. Uh, Jesus says in verse 33, but seek first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if you do that, then all these other things, the, the food and the clothing, the necessities of life, the things that you need, those will be added to you. Your job, Jesus says, is to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. If you do that, if you put the, the kingdom and God's interests above your own, even above your own necessities, make that your ultimate priority, then God will have your back. God will take care of you. He'll make sure your, uh, your needs are provided. Does that mean we don't need to pray for them then? No. Earlier in the same chapter, Jesus had given the model prayer, and part of that prayer said, uh, give us this day our daily bread. Pray for your needs to be met. And you can do that in absolute confidence, because if you're seeking first the kingdom, God will make sure that prayer gets answered. He will take care of your needs. But notice, that's not the top priority. In the prayer Jesus told us to pray, how did it begin? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means may your name be set apart as sacred. May you get the honor that you deserve. That's the top priority. And then it goes on to, to say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Before we ever get around to asking for our needs, our priority has to be God's needs, God's kingdom, for God's will to be done. That should be at the top of the list. That should be our main concern when we approach God in prayer. I want to fight God's battles. I want to see God's will accomplished in the world. I want to make God's priorities my priorities. And if I do that, then I don't have to worry about the other stuff. My needs will be taken care of. God will support me. Now, there's a, an Old Testament passage that I think makes a very similar point. A wonderful verse in 2 uh, Chronicles 16, verse 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Think about that. It's like God is on a quest looking all over the world for those people, those few people who are absolutely sold out to God and are 100% committed putting him above everything else. Who, people who are, uh, are not lukewarm, they're not half-hearted, they're not divided in heart. They are wholehearted, committed to God and seeking him above everything else. And God says, when I find someone like that, someone who puts my interests above their own interests and seeks my kingdom above their own kingdom, I will strong." support that person. And uh, that's, that's a wonderful promise. Kind of like Matthew 6.33, I believe. But uh, what I want to ask you to do this week in light of all of that is to just, uh, again, think about your own prayer life. Uh, if you got a bulletin, there should have been an insert, a half page in there. Uh, with two, two uh, sections, God's battles and our battles. And if you, if you want to, you could uh, just kind of think about some of the requests that you often uh, make in prayer. Which category would they go in? And just see how that lines up. See what you spend most of your time on in prayer. Uh, or at the very least, you could Put that in your Bible and take it out when you get ready to pray, just as a reminder that uh, we are to be seeking the kingdom of God first, and that includes in our prayer time. 
and that we want to be most concerned about fighting God's battles within rather than asking God to come and fight our battles. Nothing wrong with praying about those things. I do it myself all the time. But if you're like me, it's very easy to get consumed with my battles and never get around to praying about what's most important, and that is God's battles. And so let's just try to honestly evaluate where we are, and if we need to make a change, then let's, let's be willing to, to try to pray more in line with how the Bible teaches us to pray. In the model prayer, in the prayers of Paul that we've been looking at, we want to prioritize what God prioritizes. Fight his, God, his, his battles more than our own. Uh, I know we've gotten away from offering an invitation at the close of our uh, sermons, but I want to do that this morning and give anyone who wants the opportunity to come forward and uh, respond to the gospel invitation, if you need to uh, come in, in faith and, and uh, become a Christian this morning, be baptized into Christ, we'd be happy to assist you with that. Or maybe you just need prayer. Uh, maybe there's something on your heart that you would like us to pray with you about. Uh, we would be more than happy to do that. So if, uh, if you need prayer or subject to the invitation this morning, come now as we stand and sing together. My heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I give to you, take control. last Sunday that uh, God had uh, recently uh, highlighted a couple of sins in my heart that I still need to deal with. Uh, one of them was pride and the other was uh, selfishness. And so uh, I've asked Mike to uh, just pray, help, help me fight one of God's battles this morning by praying that God will help me to put to death the pride and the self-centeredness in my heart. So, uh, uh, Mike, if you would. Amen, God. Let's pray. Lord, you're holy. You are holy. We are not. Hallowed be your name. Holy be your name. Help us to strive to be more and more like you. Father, you've placed on Todd's heart a sin of pride and selfishness. And Lord, I feel I don't, I can't even approach you on that subject because you've placed the exact same topics on my heart for the last few weeks. That my pride and my, my selfishness affects how I treat other people. 
Father, I, for, I ask for your, your forgiveness and for your guidance on that. And Father, for Todd, for, for, for pride and for selfishness, please fill him with your spirit. Please purify him from that sin and then refill him with more and more of your presence. That's where we all want to be, Lord. Continue to reveal to us those things that, that we haven't given up, those things that, that keep us distant from you, and Father, those things that keep you from using us the way you want to use us. Those things that we put in the way, Father. Purify us, refine us with that refining fire to burn off the, those things that don't belong. Leave behind your pureness, your greatness, your spirit. Fill us. Fill us more and more Father, we believe. Help our unbelief. That's my prayer this morning. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Speaking to it's called Don't Fall. That leads up. Just a, a few things. Seek the bulletin if you want to see activities that are happening. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, we have road cleanup. Uh, see Johnny if you can help. Um, he'll tell you where to, where to meet. I have the card from early May, and it reads, to my Lake Orient Church, you can be seated. <laughs> to my Lake Orient Church, uh, I want to take this time to thank you all for the, all of you who have sent cards uh, with those great words of encouragement. I want to thank all of you for your continued prayers, which I still need from all of you. Life is full of surprises. Each day is a new chapter. Each day uh, is a, a new challenge. Uh, you have all uh, helped me uh, meet these challenges. I ask for your continued support as I continue to battle uh, with cancer. Thank you and may God bless all of you in your lives each day. Your brother in Christ, Ernie May. I uh, have a note, uh, Philip and, and Jen Livingston, uh, they asked, uh, well, their son Camden was held up at a gunpoint during a robbery at a pharmacy where he works in Ohio. Uh, please pray for his mental health, his physical recovery, and that this softens his heart towards God. Uh, they are with him today, and uh, we pray uh, for their safety as they travel as well. Uh, uh, remember Brian uh, Cadridge, uh, Kevin's brother, uh, who has COVID, who's on a ventilator at, in the hospital. Uh, we've been praying him for him and their family this week. Continue uh, for your prayers. Uh, I also have a, a, a associate at work Mike Warman, who's in the exact same situation in the hospital on the ventilator and uh, they, they don't know which way his life is going to go at this time. Uh, so continue prayers for Marie as well for his treatment and uh, the, the, just the struggles with the treatment that he's had, having. Uh, keep in mind that the family of uh, Billy Yates Again, that Sonny and Joy's nephew who, who passed this past week and for their family uh, in Texas. 
And then uh, Julie, uh, Kim Mora's sister, who has stage four cancer. We, we've announced that before, and we need to keep her in our prayers. Our, our sister, Mary Tori, who has stage four cancer, who is uh, getting some more uh, um, uh, treatment, uh, some treatment that uh, is more difficult, and we need to keep her in our prayers. Uh, Lori Holly Dio's sister as well, who has cancer. And we need to keep her in our prayers. Uh, Deb Rabel, uh, her aunt, is in hospice and, and in fragile condition. Uh, Don Bone, we talked to Don this morning. His brother's wife, Mamie Bone, died uh, this past week in Texas. Nell Bone is not feeling well, and that's why they're not here today. Also, uh, for Will Vaughn, who continues to have some uh, difficult situation with his passing, Will Boyer. Uh, boy, we have a lot of people to pray for in different, difficult, very difficult situations. Uh, health, uh, as well as other issues. Uh, but we are distracted by different things that the devil throws at us. And, and our, our Lord tells us that we're here for a short period of time. And how we deal with the temptations and the distractions makes a big difference. How we let things in our life pull us away uh, from relationships and worse from God. Why don't we go to God in prayer, asking for his forgiveness and for his help, so that we can be the soldiers he expects us to be in, in telling others about his love and his sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for just the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth and to kneel at your throne humbly and submit ourselves to you saying we sin and we let things take us away from our love from you and and the love that we should have for one another we are distracted we're pulled away in so many directions father and it's we need your help. We need your strength through your spirit to focus on you each and every hour of the day. We're sorry, Father, that we put other things first in front of you, before you. And things like we just prayed about, our selfishness, things that we want, that we think are important, that are not necessarily what you want in our life and in this world. In our pride that we just prayed about, we fill ourselves up with who we are and what we think we should be, what others think we are or should, we should be, and we forget about you and what you want us to be and who we should be, and more importantly, who we are in Christ Jesus. We're his. We're not ours. Help us to be none of that, Father. Father, we do pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help us to be mindful of your will and your desire for your children, us who you bought. Help us to be mindful of what you're doing in this world and what you want accomplished. Help us by telling us how we can be a part of that. How can we be a part of your mission and your, your desire for your kingdom? Father, we pray for our, our brother and sister Phil and Jenny as they're with their son Candom. We're sorry that he was in a situation where there was a robbery and we just pray for his mental health, for his, for him to be overcome that situation he was in, for his physical recovery as well. 
Father, we don't know how hurt he is, but we know that you know, and we pray that you will bless him to his needs. Be with Phil and, and Jenny as they they uh, love on their son and, and care for him, and, and we pray for their safety as he come back. Father, we've been praying for Brian all week, Gadrish and his family, and and Father, we, we know he's in a critical situation. We pray for Mike Norman as well, both of them in the hospital with ventilators. And, and Father, we know people have overcome this uh, COVID disease, even at this point. And we pray, Father, that your hand will be on both of these men and that you will give them the health that they, uh, that they need to overcome this disease. Father, we all have been fighting it, and we pray that we just don't take it for granted that we will be careful and, and, and not help the spread of this virus. We're thankful for the vaccine that's available, Father, for us and the other means to keep ourselves safe. Thank you for that protection. But Father, be with these families as they support their loved ones. Father, we love Ernie. He means a lot to us, and we pray that you'll continue to be with him, to, that the treatment that he takes will, will help his attack the cancer that's throughout his body. And Father, we pray for uh, just the ease of the, the situation, the, the sores in his mouth from this radiation and chemo that he's taking, Father, and we pray that you'll heal him. Heal him 100% and bring him back to us. He says, one of your soul hurts and he loves you greatly, Father. And there's more work to do. Father, be with Jenny and, the, and um, Caitlin and all their family. And Father, we pray for Joy uh, and Sonny, the, the nephew, Billy Gates, who who died this week, and we pray for their family as they mourn for their loved one. Comfort them, Father, like you, you're the only one that can. Help them, Father, as, as they have separated now because of this death. Um, be with their family. And Father, we continue to pray for uh, Kim Morris' sister, Julie, and her battle with cancer. We pray for her healing and, and her treatment that it will go well. If it be your will, Father, bring her back to her much wanted health. And our dear sister, Mary Tori, who we see week in, week, in, week out, who's fighting cancer as well. And, and the, the treatment that she's taking is, is more severe and stronger, and Father, we just pray her body can uh, can handle it, and it will wipe out the cancer in her body as well. Same with how he feels, Sister Lori. We pray for her treatment uh, as she battles cancer. Be with that brave boy as she continues to to help her aunt who's in hospice, and, and I'm sure who's fragile, and, and uh, Father, we just pray that uh, you will comfort her and her aunt and, and uh, be with Deb, who, who has difficulties as well as she cares for her aunt. Father, we pray for the uh, morning for uh, Don Bones, uh, Brother's wife, Mamie, who passed this past week. We pray that you'll bless their family as they mourn for the loss of their loved one. Be with our sister now as she's not feeling well. We pray that there's nothing serious and, and she'll be back with us soon. We pray for her healing. And our brother Will Vaughn, Father, who's found himself in a difficult situation with his past employer. Father, we pray for uh, your will be done in that situation, that the truth will, will come forth and uh, everything will go well if it be your will. Father, we have many gone today and they're traveling, and we just pray, dear Father, that you bring everyone back to this place 
uh, to their home safely. Uh, boy, there's a lot of people hurting, Father, and there's so many more. But we pray this. We pray for good health, for strength, so that we can go out in our different areas and proclaim your word, proclaim the good news of the gospel. That's why we pray for health. That's why we pray for comfort. Because as we pray today, Father, that we know our lives are short and they're only for a little while. And that we will come to a point where uh, we will depart. So the work needs to be done, and we need to do it soon. We need to do it now. So give us boldness, give us vision, give us the strength, and give us the words through your spirit so that we can do your will here. Father, last week we just pray that That when you look at each of us, you, drew, you see Christ. We know you do. You said you will. But we pray that you will be pleased on how we're living our life. Because we do want to come home. And we're grateful for your grace and your mercy that makes it all begin through our Lord and Savior Jesus. In this day that we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.